Bonjour, comment allez-vous? Uh, that's how we do it, right? We haven't done this in a while. Am I doing it correctly? Perfect, perfect. You are <laughs> spot on. You, you don't, you haven't missed a beat there, Kevin. Welcome to the More Perfect Union, the podcast that offers real debate without the hate. And I know I mispronounced comment allez-vous. I'm going to hear it from Jessica later. Hi, I'm Kevin Kelton, along with my good friends, Greg Matusak. Kevin, I'm ha- at least I can tell you I'm having a better week than Ken Paxton in Texas. <laughs> That's for you all, and all my Texas friends. Everyone else, look it up. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe Syart, a.k.a. Producer Joe. I usually try and come in with a good joke at the beginning, but I'm genuinely happy to be talking to you guys. It's been a rough work week. And when you guys proposed this a couple days ago, I figured it's been a while and I'm ready to get into it. Let's uh, let's get ready to rumble. Well, before we jump into the news of the week, which of course we always hit the news, but since it's been so long, I mean, I literally don't know how long it's been since we've done a podcast. Anybody have an idea? I want to say it was late December, I believe. Maybe early January. Okay, so we're, we're a good four or five months since yeah. we've done our last show. I hope they were a good four or five months. They were for me. And so we wanted to give people a little insight into why you haven't been hearing us on a weekly basis, other than the fact that I'm incredibly lazy. (laughs) So uh, I'll go first. I want to hear what you guys have been up to. The the three of us are just said hello briefly before the beginning of this podcast. So we haven't even caught up yet. But to let people know, there's a lot of reasons why we haven't done podcasts over the last several months. High among them is the fact that I have been struggling with some health issues, and I will reveal here for the first time for our listeners something that Joe and Greg know very well, which is that uh, in the last couple of years, I've dealt with some cancer scares. I am doing great now. Everything is behind me. You could have come back at some point, but right now my health is very good. But uh, that did take a lot of time with surgeries, with treatments, with checkups, with flying around to the Mayo Clinic and other places. So that took a lot of energy and frankly, didn't leave me a lot of energy or enthusiasm for producing a podcast every week. But uh, I'm back. I've also, I've written a new book and I'm going to bore you with the details of that uh, toward the end of the podcast, but I've got a new book coming out next month. So with that said, that's what I've been up to. Oh, and I celebrated my one year wedding anniversary. Oh, Mazel Tov. That's yes, awesome. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Greg, what about you? What have you been up to? Lots of work. Um, the uh, Work and family. I love my wife and kids. We can always get into that sort of stuff. Um, probably some of the most exciting things for me, at least, is I've been, uh, if you know my other side of my life, is uh, I play saxophone and I enjoy that. I've been saxophone hunting and I've literally spent the past four months tracking down one saxophone that I'm really close to purchasing and I won't bore people with model numbers or serial numbers, but suffice to say it's pretty much the exact same model and almost the same year as John Coltrane played on giant steps. It's my bucket list. Um, if, if I'm driving around, I'm thinking like, if I won the lottery, I would buy like these 10 saxophones. This is like number two on my list. And I might have a chance to buy it within the next two or three weeks. We're still looking into it. So the next time I see you, I am going to be a lot poorer in the (laughs) bank account, but I'll be happier in spirit. Um, I will definitely be one of those guys who has better horns than I actually play as a human being. So I'm going to be practicing a lot. So that's that's the big news. If I do get it, I'll post pictures on the uh, More Perfect Union uh, Instagram and and a website because it's it's so it's 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 so pretty it's you, so gd pretty yeah you're sort of like uh the character in the fugitive who was chasing the one-armed man for like seven years you're chasing down this one saxophone oh yeah this is this is like me and me and ahab i'm chasing this this is my <laughs> white whale this will drag me down to the bottle bottom of the ocean at least financially um anyone okay. who's who said like oh I, i'm gonna make a million dollars collecting instruments no no but it doesn't <laughs> anyone who collects anything i mean but it makes any all of us happy who do, who do things like this so 
Joe, what about you? What have you been up to? I have just been getting busier with work. This is kind of like we're coming into my Christmas or I'm just coming out of my Christmas, I will say. The start of summer is the busiest beer season. And really? Yeah, amazingly. It's like Memorial Day is our first big holiday. Fourth of July is a little less. And then Labor Day is like the end of the season. But this is the most social interaction I've had this weekend because I've just had such a physically breaking week. Like, I feel bad. They had a birthday party for my boss last night. And I was exhausted enough that I just couldn't bring myself to go. I didn't have the social energy. So I felt bad about that. And I was not going to pass up the chance to talk to you guys, even though I just got up from a nap like 10 minutes ago. And you said beer, right? Beer, yes. We are a so, beer distributor in Connecticut. Yeah, you, you, I, as I understand it, you are the um, the trans social media marketer for, for Bud Light, right? I actually, I'm going to share a terrible story from the warehouse. <laughs> I <laughs> walked upon two guys talking about how apparently they can't get rid of 30 packs of beer of Bud Light, apparently in the Midwest, selling them for 99 cents. And one guy who I think is a total piece of garbage and somebody else who I respect, we're having a conversation and they both agreed about the trans issue and we are not on the same page. And it's just I find it horrifying listening to people that non tolerant about things yeah. like that. Yeah. OK, well, we'll talk a little bit about that issue because uh, it touches on one of the subjects we're going to talk about later on. So um, primary season, Greg Matusak, I love going to you to start these discussions off. Let me just package this with Greg. You and I have been doing this now eight years. We started almost eight years ago in September of 2015 with the GOP primary in our first podcast, right? Oh, yeah. And I love primary season. Primary season is a lot crazier than the general election. Primary season is where candidates usually go either more more to the right or more to the left. They appeal more to their base, um, where you'll see the general election, they try to appeal more to the middle. You hear much more crazy talk. You'll see more fringe candidates. Um, it's awesome. Um, yeah, and you're in a state that gets actually gets candidate attention, not like Joe and I, where we're in blue states. Well, no, I'm in a red state. Joe's in a blue state and no one comes here. Well, we get we get it in the general, but we don't get because Ohio is part of the Super Tuesday group. So yeah. we don't get as much in the primary. Um, there's a lot of a um, lot of action going on that week. Uh, and so I think we're part of last year. I think it was there was nine states on that same primary. Um, so it's not quite the same during the primary, during the general. Oh, yeah. But don't be that my prediction this year is Ohio's red. Ohio is a red yeah, state now. Yeah. We will not see the same love that we've seen in the past. OK. Yeah. Joe, have you been following uh, all the uh, in people going in and out of the uh, of the GOP primary race? I have not. I saw the list of names that you guys provided, and I was going to more ask questions about it since I've stayed blissfully unaware. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so let's do it. Uh, first of all, have you heard of someone named Donald Trump? Oh, number one <laughs> heel. OK, so, Greg, what do you think? Is is Trump uh, a shoe in or is this still a primary race? Uh, there was a podcast I listened to that said, this was this was uh, about five days ago that pretty much said Donald Trump is inevitable. He is he is like without a doubt it's going to happen. And they listed all the reasons. And even after he was after the um, the uh, conviction in New York um, on the uh, that conviction, uh, uh, you mean he lost the civil case, the civil case. Excuse me. Yes. You are absolutely correct. He still got he got more popular by his base. Um and he's got several other um, legal issues that are will be coming up in the next month or two. Um, he will still continue. Number wise, he might have it if you just do it by math. He is still a force to be reckoned with. And the things he do is just more and more insane. And this goes back to eight years ago when we were discussing this and we all yeah. laughed him off. And we yeah. as he came down that golden escalator 
And we said, not a chance, not a chance, not a chance. This is a joke. And it happened. You cannot discount him. He's had a terrible record. He's had a terrible record, but he has a really good chance. He's got cash too. Okay. So let's talk about the other people that we would call the, the first tier. Okay. Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, Tim Scott, Mike Pence. There's only one person in that who's first tier. Everyone else is lower tier. Okay. So DeSantis, I assume you're talking about. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Um, Um, Do either of you think that DeSantis has a good chance, not a chance, but a good chance of stealing this nomination away from Trump? No. Joe? I think so. I know that Trump still has some degree of popularity. But I can't believe we would make that mistake again. Okay, okay. Uh, I I I don't think DeSantis is is going to be viable come uh, come December, but time will tell. Time will tell. I I always thought he was an empty suit. I think he's uh, made mistake after mistake after mistake so far, and he's only been in it a week, (laughs) Uh, including his comments about uh, the Ukraine war. Uh, what he's doing uh, with abortion in his state, what he's doing with Disney, and of course, the botched launch of his campaign. So uh, I'm not very high on Ron DeSantis's chances. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Ron, De- Ron DeSantis me. is running similar to like when Lindsey Graham ran. Do you remember when Lindsey Graham ran? Um, yeah, yeah. In 2016, Lindsey Graham came off a Senate win where he ran won by... 35 points. I mean, he 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 was a yep. huge winner in his state and he was like, I am so popular. I guess I could be president. Um, he just won governor in 2018 by or 2020, excuse me, by 20 points against Charlie Crist. And no one likes Charlie Crist though. So of course he's like, I'm so popular, I guess I could do anything. Um, when he first became governor, he was pretty much a moderate. He he exposed he espoused uh, pay raises for teachers. He was pretty much right down the middle, and then he's like, "I guess I can do anything now," and that's just not going to work because outside of Florida, which is really Trump country, he's not going to have the same base. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so you don't give much chance to uh, Tim Scott or Nikki Haley? No, no, <laughs> no. I mean. The, uh, I mean, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say about the GOP, the nicest way to call the GOP, not misogynistic or racist. Um, oh gosh, how do I say that? Oh, they're misogynistic and racist. Um, yeah. I think Tim Scott has an outside chance. Uh, I'm not predicting he's going to be the nominee. Uh, but I think if, if, if there's someone in that first tier who could surprise, I think it might be him. I, I will respectfully, okay. respectfully disagree. I mean, Herman Cain. Really, no, I, <laughs> I mean, don't I'm think Tim Scott is Herman Cain. But, no, but, but Herman your Cain point is taken. Your point when is Herman taken. Cain announced, he did really well in his announcement, and he did really well initially in the polls for the first like three, four weeks, and then immediately went down in the polls. I mean, okay. and there's always that. Oh, well, this is different. This is an alternative. We never want to see this again. Okay. And then there's the the lesser tier, which would be people like Larry Elder, Asa Hutchinson, Perry Johnson. Uh, I think John Bolton is running. And then a couple of names that I don't even recognize, Ryan Binkley and Vivek Ramaswamy. Vivek Ramaswamy is fascinating. He's the one who, and I might be wrong on this, but in a recent event, he, he suggested mandatory military service or uh, first responder service and also a civics test for all people who wanted to vote, young people who wanted to vote. And he wanted to raise the minimum age of voting. He suggested that. Now, all those things are just terrible ideas for a number of reasons. That's never going to happen. Including being unconstitutional, but. Oh, (laughs) yes. Yeah, I, I didn't even get to that. Okay, um, so let's let's move on because I think we all agree that uh, this is Trump's to lose, and you know who knows what's going to happen. And we're going to talk a little bit about the the criminal jeopardy that he's in uh, in a few minutes. But let's talk for a minute. Let's not forget that there is also going to be 
some kind of a primary contest on the left. And everybody knows that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has thrown his uh, hat into the proverbial ring and Marianne Williamson has thrown her bonnet into the ring. I'll get a lot of letters for that. <laughs> I, I mean, obviously, we can make a lot of Marianne Williamson jokes. Yeah, uh, that's that's not that's not even serious, is it? I mean, she was a terrible candidate four years ago, and she'd be a terrible candidate now. I mean, and what she, about Robert F. Kennedy Jr.? Could he mount a challenge to the incumbent president? Not at all. I can't fathom can't fathom him winning a single state in the primary. I mean, I honestly. Even with the Kennedy name, I'm trying to think of a state he might win. Maybe Louisiana. Maybe. Um, I was Joey, thinking with the Kennedy name that he could I, not necessarily win, win it, but he could do some damage just on the name alone. No, yeah. he's he's not a true Kennedy in that sense. He's not as progressive as like Ted a, Kennedy. He has very unusual liberal politics. Yeah. He is liberal on a lot of things like climate change. But he is conservative on a lot of things, like he's an anti-vaxxer. Right. And and I think stuff like that will come back and we'll see him as like just insane. Yeah, it's hard to take him seriously also. I mean, videos of him talking about his anti-vax stuff. Anti-science will be where people get him. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then what I think is the real interesting discussion to have, and I saw a conversation about this on Michael Smirkanish's show earlier today, the No Labels Party, which is a a group of uh, people, a pack that is trying to recruit one person from each party to be a unity ticket that would run third party. So before I give you my opinion on this, I'm going to go to Joe and then Greg. Joe, what do you think of the idea of a third ticket unity party? I like the idea of it, but I don't know if it would ever necessarily work. Okay. And Greg? Here, every, everyone breathing deep. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> do you do you smell that? Do you do you smell that? Like something something went bad? Oh, no. It, it, something spoiled because that's a spoiler. <laughs> That is what you smell. It's a terrible idea. And you can tell it's a terrible idea because the people leading this are Governor Larry Hogan, Republican Governor Larry Hogan, Independent Joe Lieberman, who is also terrible, and uh, uh, Senator uh, Manchin. Terrible. These three people are just out to see like, hey, how much power can we wield over this? And it's, it's a terrible idea. They will get very little support. I think when it's all said and done, I hope you're right. Uh, my fear is just the opposite that we're going to get into a 2016 situation again, where a lot of idealistic Democrats who cannot get excited about Joe Biden because he's either too old for their taste or he's not liberal enough for their taste are going to think, Oh, this is a great idea. We'll just, you know, it, uh, it's the new independent flavor of the month. Like, uh, uh, Stein was in, in 2016. And uh, and they will peel off, if there is this third party run from this unity ticket, will peel off enough liberal votes, but very few conservative votes, and could actually ensure a, 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 a Donald Trump presidency, which would be a disaster for the country, a disaster for democracy, and a disaster for everything that we hold dear. Uh, so I'm very concerned about this uh, particular growing idea. I, I think it, it 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 sounds good on paper, and in practice, it just hands the presidency to another Republican, probably Donald Trump. And and if you ask me, the best situation would be Biden getting elected, doing a year or two, stepping down, Harris presidency. <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah. and. Yeah. One of the things that, that frustrates me is Democrats do this all the time. We kill our own. We eat our own. Yeah. And it happened, obviously, in 2016. Everybody knows the tale. And I see it again because people, you know, Democrats had a chance to rally around this presidency and specifically around Vice President Kamala Harris. Yes. Who, in my opinion, has done nothing to earn all of the indignation and criticism that she has received. Vice presidents don't do anything. And why this woman is being picked apart on the left 
the right, of course, they'll they'll pick apart anybody. But why Democrats are not proud of this woman and proud of having her in that role. You know, the idea of like, oh, my God, if you vote for Joe Biden, you're really voting for a Kamala Harris presidency. That should be a positive for Democrats, not a negative. I literally had that conversation with someone uh, this morning, literally had that conversation. Um, and I said, well, that's a good thing. And they're like, oh, this is conservative friends. And they were like, I just can't believe you would do that. And I was like, uh, oh, vice president. And, but when you ask them, yeah. what is it you don't like about this woman? Do they have an answer? No, they're just like, she just doesn't seem like a president. And I'm like, <laughs> because you watch clips of her where she's laughing or she seems like she's having fun or she's glib. I said, watch an actual speech. Watch her actually do something. And they're like, no, 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 no. I couldn't. I couldn't see. I couldn't watch 10 minutes of her. She's terrible. I was like, give me a break. <laughs> It sounds like they've already picked a side and they don't want to be swayed. They they hate the idea of her. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. without a doubt. Without but, a doubt. But Democrats, they're going to get bitten in the butt because if you allow Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis to walk into the White House, you're talking about potentially a 7-2 Supreme Court that will be seated for 25 years. Oh, yeah. It could be bad. It could be You're very talking bad. about, I mean, if Donald Trump wins the presidency... Well, let's just talk about Trump for a second. Donald Trump is going to be indicted in Georgia. He's already been indicted in New York. I think he's going to be indicted by the DOJ, okay? He's going to be under criminal jeopardy in three separate cases. But those trials probably wouldn't start until the summer of 2024 or maybe even late fall of 2024. If the DOJ even goes forward with their prosecution because they have their 60 day rule. So let's just talk this. Let's game this out. OK, Trump is indicted three times. Let's say the, the Republican electorate thinks, oh, it's just a, a crazy witch hunt. And this is what liberal Democrats do to try to keep him from getting reelected. We're going to support him. He gets the nomination and somehow he wins the election. OK, go with me here. What's the first thing he does on day one? He's going to squelch the indictments. He's going to absolve the grand jury. He's going to say, like, he, he, we're no, done. He's going to appoint a, a, a hand-picked attorney general who will immediately kill that case. Oh, yeah. Now you have a constitutional crisis. You have the president has hand-picked an attorney general who has revoked a standing indictment. So on day two, you have potential impeachment. Not that he's going to get impeached, because again, you need 67 votes in the Senate to convict a president. But you're walking into a horrible constitutional crisis. In the meantime, this guy will undo all the levers of democracy. By the time he's done with two years in the presidency, they will have done away almost exclusively with early voting and, and mail in votes. They will have eliminated voting centers in predominantly black districts. They will have gone through the voter rolls and removed people on the suspicion of them having some reason that they are illegal or shouldn't vote or were, had felony convictions. They will undo democracy and it will not be the country that we, we have now or we think we should have. So that wraps up our discussion of politics and culture, but we also generally like to end on a lighter note talking about entertainment. So with that in mind, guys, what have you been watching, enjoying or not enjoying in the entertainment world the last few months? I actually saw Evil Dead Rise last night. It was the newest installment in the Evil Dead series. I loved it. <laughs> I've never heard of the Evil Dead series. How do you not know the Evil really? Dead series? Bruce Campbell? Sam Bruce Campbell, Raimi? yes. He, legendary. Army of Darkness? Army no, of Darkness no is so good. No knowledge whatsoever. It's, it, it's it, I don't, okay, cut this podcast now, quick. <laughs> cut, cut. Go watch it, and then we'll come back and talk. <laughs> no. it, it is so good. Well, what about I, more mainstream fare like uh, Succession, Ted Lasso? Um. Uh, okay, so I've been watching Ted Lasso, the finale and it could be the series finale no word on that is next week so i just finished the penultimate episode we talk about the golden age of television quite a bit 
you know, there's a lot of shows like Succession that are usually on the darker side. And when we see these great shows, Succession, Breaking Bad, Mad Men, um, we see either dark comedies, dark something, dramas. But Ted Lasso is a show that is so good and so well written that makes you feel great. And it's about characters that are well written, multidimensional. They have issues, but there's a positivity about it. I, I'm amazed at every episode, how good I feel about myself and about like, oh, I am inspired by the show not to go out and sell drugs or to write, you know, um, advertising that will crush my competitors, but rather just to make other people feel good. I am going to be sadly disappointed when this show ends next week. And if you do see it before I do, no spoilers, because... <laughs> So and, and, and I know you don't like it, do you, Kevin? I don't watch it. I, it's not that I don't like it. I think it's a very well-made show, and I really do appreciate everything that you uh, said about it, that it's an upbeat, feel-good show. There's nothing wrong with that. This is I I've just, had girls break up with it. me this way. This is how girls break up with me. <laughs> it's oh, me, I appreciate not you. I appreciate you, and there's nothing wrong with you. Go on, <laughs> right. keep going. I can take right. it. I can well, take I, it. I'm breaking up with you in terms of television watching. Oh my goodness. Um, now I could talk for an hour just on succession, but I, I don't think that you guys are probably as, as into it as I am. And I'm not sure that there's anything that we could add to the discussion unless I'm mistaken. Uh, Greg, are you a fan? No, I, I I'll, I'm honest. Uh, I can appreciate it. It's such I know a it's a good, good show. Succession no. is such a feel good show. Yeah, it's about no, family no, no. and community and people no. succeeding in life. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the WWE, which sometimes feels like almost real life succession, but like, I don't yeah, know. Let's not go down that. Yeah, let's not go down that road. Yeah, not go down that road. That's, That's another thing that I, I keep hearing from my listeners or listeners saying, nobody, we're not into that. Why, no, why are we no, talking no, about no. that? every week? <laughs> hey, have you guys heard of a show called The Diplomat? Yeah, no. with Carrie Russell. Yes. Um, yes. You know, it's it's funny. I have a, I have a very conservative friend who was like, oh, you have to watch this. It's all about a bumbling oaf of a president. <laughs> and, he, is, and, he is a Joe Biden like character. Yes. And, and and he's like, it's 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 obviously Joe Biden. It's uh and they're making fun of Michael him through McKean the whole thing. Playing, yeah. plays it really well, by the way. And and I finally said, Do you think that it's just because Joe Biden is president that they actually have a guy that is, you know, I mean, it's supposed to be, it is supposed to be. And he's like, no, 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 you, you don't understand. They're sticking it to Joe Biden. I was like, you know what? I think I, I don't know how to feel about that. Cause I, I don't think that's what the show's about. See, but, I don't see the character and, and uh, th this is. Yeah. 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 Tell me the holder stuff. Sure. The sure. Stuff. Sure. Sure. I don't see Michael McKeon's take on the president as being bumbling. Right. I see him as being an effective president who, yes, is torn between political dynamics and, yes, has a very strong chief of staff who guides him or tries to guide him. He is Joe Biden light, I would say. Is he is so so I I haven't watched it because I've been kind of turned off by this like oh you're going you're going but is he inept is the president inept I don't think so maybe others might disagree but I don't see him that way there is infighting in his administration but I think that's part of the commentary of the show of the show that a diplomat in a you know a, a high level ambassadorship like you know the ambassador to Britain right uh, to the United Kingdom has to deal with all of this infighting in a, in, an, in any administration. I think that's what they're saying. Yeah, and, and Kerry Russell is is so talented, uh, whether it was the Americans, and um, and of course we all love Felicity, um, and even her run on Scrubs uh, is, 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 just a, is just a gem. I mean, and is an underrated actress. And once again, the Americans – to watch that <laughs> i gotta see really... that series i've heard great things and i haven't seen it yet hey i want to ask you guys about yeah. one other series that I'm, I'm gonna guess you're not familiar with have you heard of a series called a small light no, no you stumped me again but i'm okay, sure i'd appreciate it okay. it's about it's about um world war ii and it's okay. about the people who hid Anne frank and her family the oh not about the Franks, although they're a big, big component of the show. Sure. But the story is really about the people 
who courageously and at great risk to themselves put them in hiding and took care of them for two years, providing food, making sure that you know they don't get caught, and, and doing other things to help other people in jeopardy. It's a beautifully written, beautifully acted series. Liev Schreiber plays Otto Frank. The other actors are also stellar. It's worth watching. Uh, it, it's not a feel-good show because it's about Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, but it's an important show for our time and for history. Yeah, there's there's not a lot of good feel-good Holocaust Nazi films. So yeah, you're absolutely <laughs> yeah, yeah. Except maybe well, the, the producers. producers. <laughs> <laughs> I showed I showed my kids Jojo Rabbit. Um, oh yeah, great film. Great film, and it, it is. It's my. I have a. I have an older child who's seventeen. It's. It's their favorite film. It's their favorite film. But uh, I just remember just sobbing, just sobbing, and everyone in the room crying, and one of them screaming, "Why did you show this to us?" And I was like, "I don't know." Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, excellent. Um, I will check that out. I will. That sounds really interesting. And yes, finally, uh, you know, we don't talk about literature too much on this series, but oh. uh, on this podcast, but there's a new book that's creating a, quite the sensation out there. Have you heard of a book called Things We Shouldn't Do? Um, I think I have. It's, 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 it's by one of my favorite writers, actually. Oh, uh, who would that be? He's got an alliterative name. Um, oh, it's Kevin <laughs> Kelton. Well, actually, it's by KB Kelton on the cover of this oh, one. Oh, look at you, fancy. <laughs> I, I, it up. I, that's going to fool a lot of people. They're not going to be able to figure out that pseudonym. Um, <laughs> yes, I've got a new novel coming out, my third novel. And this is actually a two-book series. And I'm publishing the first one in a matter of weeks. And very proud of it. But have been through some interesting twists and turns. May I bore you guys with some of this uh, before we... We oh. say good night. Oh, please do. Please do. <laughs> so I don't write for a genre. I, I come up with a story that I like and I say, I want to tell this story. So my first book was, uh, you know, a dark dystopian satire about marriage and divorce. Okay. Satiric. That sounds like Kevin Kelton. My second book was about, it was a, a modern day love story about a ballet dancer and a comedy writer. Where did I get that idea from? And then this book I wanted to do something that was a little bit more adult, a little bit edgier, a little bit sexier, and talked about cultural taboos, because I'm fascinated by things that we're not supposed to do, but people do them anyways. And so I I started writing these three stories, going back and forth between them, and they ended up being three novellas. They're not full novels, but they're three shorter novels. And so two of them are in book one. The longest one and the one that I think is the best story is in book two. And in each book, although they're about men and women because they're about couples and they're about sex, the, the driving character is, is a female in all three stories. And so I'm writing this book and I'm designing a cover and I came up with a cover that had a beautiful image of a, of a woman who is sitting cross-legged and with her arms like this crossed. She's not wearing clothes, but she's not naked because everything's covered up. And it's a beautiful photograph that I was able to license from the photographer. And I put it on the cover and I put it out there on social media to ask people, what do you think of my cover? Because that's what writers do. We, we test our, our covers before we publish. And most people loved it. But a lot of women, when they realized that a man had written a book about women, I got such crap, guys. <laughs> I got such reversed sexism crap. Who are you to write a story about women? Where do you get off? You know, as if men have never written for women characters before. So what do you think? It, it, it brings up the issue of cultural appropriation, that trans characters should be played by trans actors and should be written by trans people. Black stories should be written by Black people. Women's stories should be written by women. Do you believe in that? I I think there's there's ideally and to a point. So like if if we talk about like autism for example, okay, there are, there there are two shows on TV, The Big Bang Theory and um The Good Doctor, okay? Both have characters 
with autism or on the spectrum yes. on the spectrum thank you and both are written very poorly according to most people with autism okay but what about uh i'm glad you brought that up rain man i would say that most people think that rain man was a brilliant film right written by people that were not autistic right but at the same time um abed from community is something that people talk about all the time and a lot of people claim that dan Harmon is on the spectrum who was one of the main writers and it's how the character was approached and how the character is treated. And the actor who plays Ovid uh, is not on the spectrum in a perfect world. Yes, but we don't live in a perfect world. And as far as men writing women and women writing men, I think men have stories that are about women. And I think women have stories that are about men. J.K. Rowling wrote a whole series of books about a little boy. From, she wasn't a wizard. And she wasn't <laughs> a wizard. And I'm kind of okay about her writing a book from a boy's perspective. If someone takes I think it. People should yeah. read the book first and then decide whether I captured the internal dialogue of a woman. Okay. Or the emotions of a woman. From what I've seen, there, it seems like there's a big shift towards that, like representation, having women write for women, you know, like that. But representation is fine, but it should be. I think exclusive. everything should be taken on a case by case basis and read the work of art first, see what you feel about it and then say, hey, this part of it doesn't feel genuine to me. Yeah. But just Let's remember, attack Lolita, out a of the doll's game. house, little women, all written by men. And I could go down the line. That's well, it's, where things it's literally are. Literally judging a book by its cover. Exactly. Yeah. Those so, are some um, fine covers you've had, by the way. I've well, so here's the thing. So so my cover got rejected by Amazon because they said it was too racy. Now, I disagree. Almost everyone who I showed it to disagrees, but you can't fight City Hall. I appealed, I lost again. So Amazon killed my cover. So I'm now in the process of designing a, a, a new cover, and I've got uh, a couple of different designs that I'm working on. Designing the cover has been more work and more stress than writing the novel. I was going to add one more book. Um, has anyone read uh, Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner? No. I'm familiar with it, but I have to admit that I have not read that. Okay. It's it's a it's a very difficult book to read. It's set up in four different sections, but the first section is written from the viewpoint of an intellectually disabled man. This was the term okay. he used. So- a lot of the thoughts we would have said on the spectrum now. So a lot of the thoughts aren't connected or there's they're rambling or they move. And it's it's a fascinating book. It's it's really well written. There's but some in his in day, before he was, and I'm doing air quotes now, the William Faulkner that we know is a great American novelist. Yeah. You know, people could have come down on him. Henry James. But Henry um, James does, including Portrait of a Lady. And uh, Afternoon of a Fawn. And so uh, anyways, getting yes. back to me. <laughs> sorry, I'm really sorry. Most, no, that's really the most important topic. So my book, uh, and, and for people who are out there who might be wondering what it is we're talking about, it's three stories, one about a, a couple and specifically the woman in her 20s, one about a couple where the woman is in her 30s, and one about a married couple where the woman is in her 40s, okay? And each woman in these couples gets involved with some behaviors that um, society might frown upon. And we see what the repercussions are for them as things ripple along. For instance, I'll tell you that one of the stories is about a couple in their 30s where they get involved with an OnlyFans style website. On a lark, he takes a couple of photos of her, posts them, She's at first, she's a little bit taken aback because I didn't know that you were going to post those photos. I thought they were just for us. But she's also kind of thrilled when she sees that people are really digging her and they continue it and become internet sensations. And then the story evolves from there. So I, I think these are fun, modern stories that take a look at what it is that we as a culture say is appropriate, what it is is inappropriate what is pornography is online web exhibitionism is that sex work you know a lot of people say it is oh yeah 
So these are some of the questions that that I deal with in these books. Um, and the third book, which I'm very proud of, it will not be released for another few months because it's the follow-up book, actually grows out of something that you guys know I've I've experienced, but not in the way that the couple has. As you know, I've uh, experienced kidney cancer and bladder cancer over the last three years. And I am aware that at a certain point that I did not get to, sometimes when you have to say goodbye to your prostate and your bladder, it's a lifestyle change that can greatly affect your sex life. And so the couple in my book is grappling with that. A vibrant woman in her 40s whose partner can no longer keep up with her. So oh. it's stuff like that where you say, what is the moral implications? Are the choices these people make, are they morally right? Are they ethically right? And what are the consequences that may not be seen? So I hope I didn't give too much away, but I'm very proud of it. And I hope people will read them because I didn't write them just for me. <laughs> well, I hope people buy them. I'm not so much concerned that people read them. I mean, let's let's let make sure they buy them first. So. I'd be happy with either or both. If it's anything like your other books, these are going to do well. You're a great writer. And the way that you framed the stories, I'm interested to get in. I'm interested to get the book now and see how they unfold. Even well, if you are culturally appropriating. I unfortunately, don't, I, you're a little too young to read these books. Uh, yeah, I was uh, going to say, you're wait, wait, wait till you're old enough to vote. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think the cutoff is 42 years old. I think you're just under. Oh, that. no. Yeah, yeah, I'll wait till my birthday next year. It'll be a nice, you know, okay. midwinter <laughs> present. They, they won't be stocking stuffers for my kids. That's for sure. <laughs> there you go. No, they should not be. Well, listen, uh, we went a little long, but I think considering the fact that we haven't done a podcast in a while, it's well-deserved. It's, it's gravy. It's so fun it, catching up with you guys. Oh, it's it's the best. It's the best. Yeah, I've been missing it just as much as our listeners have. And before we go, we did experience a death within the podcast. Oh, thank I you. Don't, thank you for bringing that up. Yes. I wanted to do it at the top, but you got on such a roll. And I wanted to at me for interrupting before. So I wanted to save it for the end. Joe, thank you so much. And of course, you're talking about Alan Keeney. Yes. Uh, who composed our theme song and is the late husband of Sally Keeney, who is one of our, uh, you know, very regular listeners and, and quite a, a supporter of us. And we love uh, Sally and we loved Alan. Uh, he was a fine musician on in his own right. And um, yes, we lost him just a couple of weeks ago. And I'm so glad you brought that up. It was my intention to do that too. Alan was a great musician. I And through the, the uh, clips that Sally's been putting up, you can, if you ever get a chance to see them, an incredible musician, wonderful bass player. And also we had him on the show at least once, maybe twice. He was a good dude. Just yeah. a really good guy. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, our hearts we, go out to yeah. uh, everyone in his family. And of course, especially Sally, uh, we're thinking of you. We know that you'll be listening to this, and um, we we are giving you and sending you air hugs uh, of the tightest kind. Yes, very much. That is such a good theme song at the beginning, and sad we lost him. Yes, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, with that, we want to thank everybody for listening. We will be doing this again. We will not wait another four months. Hopefully, we won't even wait another four weeks. And uh, Greg Matusak, how will you be spending Memorial Day? Oh, I'm going to fix my grill. I'm going to maybe cook some steaks. I'm going to probably try to indict Trump. Everyone else is. <laughs> um, you know, just, just like every other average All American. All American stuff. All American stuff. 